Now I don't have to look at my own face in the corner. This is so much better. <laughs> so changing away from the non-syndromic hearing loss or hearing impairment, I wanted to highlight a few forms of syndromic hearing loss. Um, uh, excuse me, let me flip my site, slides quick. Um, so these are conditions that are associated with either malformations of the external ear, so a physical difference in the structure of the ear, or with malformations in other organ systems or medical problems involving other organ systems. So you can kind of think of these conditions as hearing loss plus. There's something else, something else going on that might be of medical or developmental significance to know about. So for some families who choose to pursue genetic diagnosis, a big motivating factor can be, we know my child has deafness or hearing impairments. Do we know if there is another risk for any other medical complications that we need to be looking out for? Now, to date, more than 400 syndromic forms of hearing loss have been described, um, but I'm just going to highlight a few that are more likely to come up in your day-to-day -day practices. So to start, we have a condition called Pendred syndrome. Pendred syndrome is an autosomal recessive form of syndromic hearing loss. Again, our quick review, two copies of the gene. In order for a person to have symptoms of Pendred syndrome, both copies need to have a mutation. In Pendred syndrome, about half of the time, children have a mutation in a gene called SLC26A4. And the other half the time, we are not able to find a genetic cause for their hearing impairment and their Pendred syndrome. So we think there's another gene out there that hasn't been discovered yet. Now the SLC26A4 gene, we know that this, this gene creates a protein that's found in very high concentrations in the inner ear and also in the thyroid. And that kind of dictates the signs and symptoms of Pendred syndrome. Folks with Pendred have a congenital presentation of severe profound sensory neural hearing impairments. They also have a very specific anatomic change in the ear called an enlarged vestibular aqueduct or EVA. The EVA can lead to vestibular dysfunction or balance issues. And then because that protein is also really present in the thyroid, we can see children with Pendred syndrome having a goiter or an enlarged thyroid gland. This is benign, it doesn't hurt the child, but it is a very common feature of Pendred syndrome. Now, because families are uh, concerned sometimes about Pendred syndrome, it's the reason um, that we recommend inner ear imaging to look for the EVA and also a thyroid ultrasound to check for enlargement when kids are diagnosed with a hearing impairment. Our next autosomal recessive syndrome associated with hearing impairment is a condition called Jervell and Lang Nielsen syndrome. It's a long name, we just call it JLN. This is another autosomal recessive disorder, two copies of the gene, both copies with a mutation. In this particular condition, there are two genes known, KCNE1 and KCNQ1. And these um, particular uh, genes produce proteins that are involved in the inner ear structures and also in the heart. So we can see kids who have congenital severe profound sensory neural hearing loss and a specific rhythm abnormality in the heart called a long QT interval. So the regular heart rhythm is disrupted and part of the rhythm takes a little bit longer to recharge. And this puts a person at risk for syncope or fainting and also sudden cardiac death. The existence of JLN syndrome is the reason why we recommend an EKG or a cardiac rhythm uh, evaluation for a lot of newly diagnosed children with hearing impairment. Another autosomal recessive syndrome that is associated with hearing loss that I like to include is something called biotinidase deficiency. 
Um, this condition is a little bit different because these kids do not present with hearing impairment from birth. The hearing impairment develops over time when children with this condition are not treated. So biotinidase deficiency is um, associated with the body's ability to process biotin, which is a vitamin um, that's found in foods like liver, egg yolks, and milk. It's a critical component. We need these things in our diet. We need biotin to function. And biotinidase deficiency impairs a person's ability to get the biotin from these food sources. Um, when untreated, we see things like hearing impairments with variable onset and severity. We see neurological symptoms like seizures, hypertonia or tight muscles, developmental delay, ataxic gait problems. We see rashes all over the body, hair starts falling out. Um, it's a very, very severe condition when untreated. However, this is an extremely treatable condition. We supplement a person's diet with biotin and it essentially takes care of all of the signs and symptoms that we see. So for this reason, biotinidase deficiency is included in the newborn screen or the PKU test, which is the heel stick test that's done for all babies born in the state of Louisiana. So babies are tested at birth to see if they have biotinidase deficiency. And if they do, we put them on a biotin supplement and that pretty much takes care of everything. Our final recessive syndromic hearing loss disorder we're gonna be talking about is of course, Usher syndrome. This is Louisiana, a talk would not be complete without mentioning Usher. There are multiple different types and subtypes of Usher syndrome, but they are all inherited in an autosomal recessive pattern. So two genes, two mutations. Altogether, Usher syndrome is considered the most common type of recessive sensory neural hearing loss and visual dual impairment. So effective individuals have deafness as well as visual impairment, specifically retinitis pigmentosa, and individuals can also have vestibular dysfunction or the balance problems as well. Now, amongst the deafblind population in the United States, excuse me, gotta do my little dance. <laughs> Um, about 50% of people who are deafblind in the United States carry a diagnosis of Usher syndrome. Now, as you may or may not be aware, Usher syndrome is particularly common in our part of the world. There's a link between one specific subtype of Usher syndrome, specifically type 1C, and the Acadian or Cajun populations of Louisiana. This link has been known for decades, and it's attributed to a single mutation that came from the French Canadians, the Acadians, to the Cajuns who settled in Louisiana. Um, so you might see families with Usher syndrome talk about how they have the Cajun mutation. That's listed up at the top of the slide here, the, the common Usher-1C mutation in Louisiana populations. Talking now a little bit about dominant forms of syndromic hearing loss. So two copies of the gene, one copy with the mutation is enough to cause symptoms. First up, we have Wardenburg syndrome. There are many different genes which cause Wardenburg syndrome. Most of them are dominant forms of this disorder and rarely recessive. The genes are listed on the slide here. All of these genes are involved in making several different types of cells specifically the melanocytes or melanocytes, which are involved in producing pigment in our hair, skin, and eyes. Um, a lot of people don't realize this, but melanin is also really important for the function of the inner ear, and it's also expressed in the intestines. So if a person has a hard time creating their own melanin, this is where we see the signs and symptoms of Wardenburg syndrome. So we see variable congenital hearing loss, a person can have different color eyes. We see this gentleman here, this young man who has a brown eye and a strikingly different blue eye. Looks very, very striking. We can see the white blaze of hair, or the white forelock. Again, it's an issue with producing pigment. And then rarely folks can be born with anomalies in their upper limbs, limbs and an intestinal condition called Hirschsprung disease. Not as common, um, but 
something we check these kits for, certainly. Another dominant syndromic form of hearing loss is called Stickler syndrome. I'm biased, but I've, I've worked with a ton of families with Stickler syndrome, and I think this might be my favorite of all genetic conditions and my favorite patient population to work with. Um, I just adore my families with Stickler. Um, Stickler syndrome is caused by mutations in several different genes that are all involved in making components of collagen. If you see the gene list on the screen, you'll notice that they all start with COL. Very creatively, COL stands for collagen. Now, collagen is involved in giving structure and strength to our connective tissues, which are all throughout of our body. And if our body doesn't make enough collagen or if the collagen we make doesn't function correctly, we see issues with those connective tissues, which again, are all throughout the body. So with Stickler syndrome, we can see conductive sensory neural or mixed hearing loss. The onset and severity can be kind of variable and sometimes it's progressive, sometimes it's less so. We also see features of a connective tissue disorder. So if you're familiar with conditions like Marfan syndrome or Lois Dietz or Ehlers-Danlos, we can see some overlap with the symptoms there. These kids have a lot of eye issues, high myopia, cataracts, and even retinal detachment. So these kids tend to wear very, very thick glasses and definitely would benefit from services with the deafblind community. Um, kids can have very distinct facial features with a flattened facial profile, as you see in this adorable little girl over here. This can lead to issues with sinuses and recurrent ear infections, which can also impact children's hearing. And then we see skeletal issues like early onset arthritis. Um, I usually have a, a saying when I'm working with students who are interested in genetics and genetic counseling that if you see a child that is just the cutest child you've ever seen in your life, they probably have Stickler syndrome because these kids are just, they're just the cutest kids. Talking a little bit about an X-linked condition, so a disorder that is uh, impacted by the sex of the person who has it, we can talk about Alport syndrome. So about 80% of cases of Alport syndrome are caused by mutations in an X-linked gene called COL4A5. This uh, gene lives on the X chromosome. So women have two copies of the gene, whereas men only have one in most cases. Um, this can lead to differences in the presentation of Alport syndrome amongst men and women based on biological sex chromosomes. Again, we see that this is a disorder associated with collagen, the COL part of the gene. Um, and this type of collagen in Alport syndrome it's really important in the structure of the inner ear, and it's also really important in the kidneys and the eyes. So that's where we see the signs and symptoms of Alport syndrome show up. We see sensory neural hearing impairment, but it does tend to be post-lingual. Um, in my experience and in the literature, these are school-age kids who start having difficulties with their hearing in that kind of elementary to middle school time period. We also see progressive renal disease and eye abnormalities. Now, these eye issues that are associated with Alport do not typically cause visual impairment, but they do cause differences with kind of the structure and function of the eye. So again, these kids might benefit from being connected with uh, Nikki and the deafblind services that are offered. Two quick mitochondrial causes of syndrome and hearing impairment. The first one is MELAS. MELAS stands for mitochondrial encephalopathy or encephalomyopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes. It's a lot easier to say MELAS. Um, there are many different genes in the mitochondria that can cause MELAS, but some of the symptoms that we see are progressive and variable sensory neural hearing loss, um, pretty significant mental status changes called encephalopathy, we can see medical episodes that mimic strokes, and there can also be some very uh, serious and concerning metabolic or chemical changes in the blood called lactic acidosis. 
we can see people having things like seizures, um, severe illnesses, paralysis, um, just a lot of really scary medical issues. Hearing loss can be a part of it. And then a final type of uh, syndromic hearing impairment associated with the mitochondria is a condition called Kieran Sayer syndrome. This condition doesn't typically get passed through families. It's usually just affecting one child in a family. Um, and that's because of the, the type of genetic change that it is. It's, it's a little bit more of a serious genetic change. But these individuals can have um, mild to moderate high frequency sensory neural hearing loss, progressive external ophthalmoplegia and ptosis, so a difficult time controlling the muscles that move the eyes and also that move the eyelids. We can see another eye issue called pigmentary retinopathy. We can see problems with the heart and the function of the heart. We can see skeletal and neurological problems, kidney disease, short stature, dementia, diabetes, just a whole slew of issues, including hearing and visual impairments. All right, so that was our rapid fire genetics lesson talking about syndromic and non syndromic forms of hearing impairment. Mm -hmm. Before I get into talking about the evaluation and testing process, what questions are coming up for y'all? Um, is there a condition that might be kind of like a cousin to Alport syndrome? I have some students that, a, a three pack of them actually, that are, <laughs> uh, excuse me, it's, a mild to moderate hearing loss and a very serious like kidney functioning problem. None of the parents involved could remember anything about like the name of the syndrome other than they knew it was connected. Okay. Anything I would about? definitely encourage them to be evaluated for Alport syndrome because that's the big one that comes up for me. Um, are they siblings? Are they cousins? Are they unrelated? They're not related at all. They're random children that I got all at the same time. The universe always works like that. Yeah, to my knowledge, the one that really stands out for me when I think kidneys plus ears is Alport syndrome. And um, yeah, I would definitely, definitely encourage those families if they're interested to get some testing and evaluation. I think a few of them had been tested already okay. and they just don't know what the name of the thing that they have is, but they're all on the younger side and Alport okay. said like 10 plus. So is it most likely to be that then? It could be one of the other forms, like the less common forms of Alport. Mm -hmm. um, the the X-linked form is the one that tends to be 10 plus. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? And like I said, there are hundreds of different types of syndromic or syndromes that are genetic that have hearing loss as a component. So that's by no means an exhaustive list. All right. Um, I'll transition then into talking a little bit about the genetic evaluation and testing process. So what actually happens when a family decides, okay, we want to meet with genetics. We want to know a little bit more about what's going on. So what's actually going to happen when they come and see our clinic? We often find that a lot of families, especially families with young children, have maybe not necessarily had the greatest experience with healthcare providers. So I always think it's nice to be able to provide a little bit of anticipatory guidance and to be able to talk with your families a little bit about what to expect if they go and see a genetics provider. So typically a family is first gonna meet with a genetic counselor, someone like me. We're gonna review the medical and developmental history of the child. We're gonna take a very detailed family history those are those structures or those pictures, we call them a pedigree. Um, and we're gonna focus on uh, relatives with hearing loss and any other features of concern that might point us in a direction towards syndromic or non-syndromic hearing impairment. Next, a person might meet with a geneticist, which is an actual physician with specific training in both pediatrics and medical genetics. Um, this is going to be really to evaluate for subtle features of a syndromic hearing loss versus non-syndromic. So very thorough head-to-toe physical exam, focusing on any mild differences that a child might have that could clue us in into what type of genetic condition they may have, if any. 
Um, we rely a lot on the audiometric and physiologic testing to characterize a child's hearing impairment. Those are not done within the genetics clinic, but we rely on our ENT and audiology colleagues to give us that type of information, which can again um, help us kind of narrow the fields about what we really need to be focused on with our testing. And then finally, if we're able to narrow the differential diagnosis, or even if we aren't, we can offer molecular genetic testing to confirm whether or not a child's hearing impairment has a genetic basis. So this is a little bit more of a formalized kind of decision tree in how the workup for prelingual hearing loss is supposed to happen. We start, like I said, with that history, that physical exam, and the audiometric testing to clarify exactly what type of hearing impairment a person has. We then look for any specific other findings, which could tell us, is this looking syndromic or not? That will then, again, lead us towards kind of what additional evaluations or genetic testing is offered. But if you follow all the paths in this tree, you'll notice that everything leads to genetic testing. Oops. Um, now, ultimately, the decision on whether or not to pursue genetic testing or not is extremely personal. Genetic testing, it's kind of my opinion and the opinion of the field that genetic testing should be offered as standard of care, but it is not in any way a requirement of care. So some people are really motivated. Um, they wanna know the cause of their hearing loss or their child's hearing loss. They might wanna know, you know what are the risks for future pregnancies or other people in the family. Um, and they might want to manage their risk for other health concerns if they know they're say at risk for developing a goiter or kidney disease or something like that. Um, but other families don't and that's okay. Full stop, genetic testing is never a requirement. Um, we are acutely aware that the deaf and hard of hearing communities face a lot of bias and barriers to care in accessing medical care um, related to their hearing impairment and not. Um, so as a genetic counselor, I feel quite strongly that you, the patient, the family, whoever is coming to see me in clinic, that is my main priority and I will advocate for whatever your want or need is, regardless of your decision to pursue testing or not. So. Highly personal, never required. Now there are a ton of different genetic testing labs that offer gene panels specifically geared towards testing genes associated with hearing impairment. Um, basically every commercial genetic testing lab that's out there at this point offers some type of product geared towards testing for hearing loss or deafness. Um, I'm going to highlight the top two labs on this slide, Invitae and Gene DX, just because as providers in Louisiana, these are the labs that are probably going to be used most often. They play nicely with Louisiana Medicaid. So this is probably what you're going to see um, your patients and your clients using. So Invitae is a genetic testing lab that's based in California, and they offer this genetic test called the Invitae Comprehensive Deafness Panel. Um, this panel includes 224 genes. It includes genes associated with both syndromic and non-syndromic hearing impairment. So you don't need to narrow the field about what you're testing for. You can kind of just do this broad test. Um, importantly, it does not include mitochondrial DNA. So if you suspect that a child might have hearing loss because of an aminoglycoside exposure, or um, if a child has features suggestive of a mitochondrial disease like MELAS, this is not a good test for that family. Um, in terms of the logistics of getting this genetic test, any healthcare provider who has the ability to order testing can order this test. The pediatrician, the ENT, the geneticist, anyone can order this test who is a physician or has the ability to order testing. This test can be billed to private insurance and also to Louisiana Medicaid. Some insurances cover the testing, some insurances don't. This test also can be ordered as a self-pay test, which means insurance is not used at all and the family decides to pay out of pocket for the test. And the price of this for those families who do self-pay is $250. So when I'm talking to families who have concerns about the out-of-pocket costs of testing and, oh, genetic testing is so expensive, thousands and thousands of dollars, it isn't. The most you'd have to pay for this specific test is 250 bucks. 
which is in the grand scheme of things, a lot less than a lot of people are, are thinking it's gonna be. Now, Dean DX is the other lab that you're likely to come across or your families are likely to work with. This panel is a little bit smaller. It's 146 genes, again, associated with syndromic and non-syndromic hearing impairment. Um, again, it does not include mitochondrial DNA, but this lab does offer a separate test to look at mitochondrial DNA. And again, just like the past lab, this can be billed to insurance, both private and public insurance plans, and the cell pay price is $250. So again, that's kind of the cap that your family should anticipate having to pay for genetic testing for hearing impairment. Um, real quick, before I jump into test, like talking about what the results actually look like, anyone have any questions about the evaluation process or the labs that we use? Okay, I will say one quick note about the evaluation process. Um, there is extremely limited access to genetic services in Louisiana. So for people who do not have an urgent medical concern, like if a child is not critically ill and they just need a routine appointment with genetics, it's a good idea to counsel your families that it could take a year or more to get an appointment. It's awful, it, it, it excuse me, but it really sucks. Um, but unfortunately, that's just the landscape that we're practicing in right now, where appointments take a long time to get. All right. I have a question. Yeah. Um, this is a dumb question, probably. I don't know if my yeah. video is what it needs no, to no be. Questions. But so when they finally do, they choose, say, Gene DX, um, they just get some blood drawn at a local place and then send it in with that? What? How does that? That's not a dumb question at all. Um, so both of these labs are able to do genetic testing on a blood sample. You'd go to the doctor's office or the lab, you'd get one tube of blood, three to five mils taken, goes off easy peasy. But for kids who are averse to blood draws or even for adults who are a little squeamish, both of these labs offer the ability to do testing on a buckle swab, which is just a cheek swab. So basically it's a big Q-tip. They can ship it to your house. You rub the inside of your mouth, you ship it back. Really, really easy to do. So another question, um, since it could take a year to get an appointment, are there like home tests, like things that they could, you know, like why, if it, if it's see, I mean, it seems in my simple mind that if you can just do a little swab and send it off and then get the results, why <laughs> take so yeah. long just to back up providers? Yeah, no, great question. Um, and that's why I like to emphasize it does not need to be a geneticist who orders this test. Um, a lot of providers are not comfortable ordering genetic testing because the interpretation can get a little confusing. That's what we'll talk about in the next few slides but it does not need to be done in a geneticist's office. Um, now, at this point, we don't have um, direct to consumer testing options for minors in the United States, just legally, ethically, billing wise, it gets really confusing. Um, so we families can't order this test for their child, but um, if families are comfortable advocating with for themselves with the support of their great team, um, it's possible to get the genetic testing done before the appointment with the genetics physician. Thank you. Absolutely. Do you know which of these services um, Medicaid pays for? Both. Cool. Um, and I should say that there's a caveat there. Medicaid may or may not actually pay for it, but these labs will do the testing at no cost whether or not they get reimbursed. So it's a pretty great system. And it's it wasn't around even three years ago. So this is all pretty new that we've been able to offer these services for our patients, regardless of what name is on their insurance card. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So one major reason why non-genetics providers might be a little bit reticent or reluctant to order genetic testing for their patients and families is because of the difficulty in interpreting results. Um, 
because of HIPAA and privacy concerns, I don't have any real results reports in my next few slides, but I do have some examples of kind of what different types of results look like and why it might be a little bit intimidating for someone who isn't trained in genetics to get these results and talk to a family about it. So in general, when we get a genetics results report, whether it's a genetic test for hearing loss or cancer or heart defects, the results are going to come back in a table. And that table is going to have some standard categories that are always included. The first one is if there's a mutation detected, there's going to be a category for the gene and the gene name. So what gene are we talking about? Where does this mutation occur in the DNA? Next, there's going to be a column that talks about the mode of inheritance for this particular gene and its related genetic condition. So this is where we'll get the information of, is this a gene that's recessive or a dominant disease gene, X-linked, whatever, that'll be an inheritance column. Next, there's going to be the variant. This is the specific mutation or the genetic change that was discovered, and it's going to be included in two different ways. You'll get a C dot and then a P dot. Those specific things are not typically very important for families to know, but that is what the actual mutation is, that C dot and P dot. Next, there's going to be a category or a column that talks about something called zygosity. Now, zygosity is a very overly complicated way of saying, all right, we have two copies of the gene. How many gene copies have the mutation? So if we have two copies of a gene and one copy has a mutation, that is a heterozygous mutation. It's on one copy of the gene. If it's a homozygous variant, both copies have the same mutation. So we've got two already that are affected. And hemizygous doesn't come up as much it's really only used in X-linked conditions, and it refers to if men on their 1X chromosome have one mutation on their 1X chromosome, that's a hemizygous variant. So heterozygous, homozygous, hemizygous. And then finally, you'll get a category with the classification. So this is the lab looking at all the available data and saying, okay, does this mutation cause disease or probably cause disease? Or do we genuinely not know what it does? And those classifications are pathogenic, disease-causing, likely pathogenic, probably disease-causing, or a variant of uncertain significance. It's a question mark. We just don't know. So as a non-genetics person, you're getting a table with all this information. It's a lot to take in. It can be very, very intimidating. So here's an example of a test result that is a positive or a diagnostic result. How do I know that? All right, first, it's heterozygous. So we have two copies of the gene. We know that one copy has a mutation. Likely pathogenic, that mutation that we have, we know is likely to cause disease. And this is an autosomal dominant disorder. So you only need one copy of the mutation to cause disease. So we know this is positive because the MITF gene is associated with autosomal dominant Wardenberg syndrome type two. This result would be consistent with the diagnosis of Wardenberg syndrome. So even though this is a positive straightforward result, it's pretty intimidating. Now here's another example of a positive result. We've got two heterozygous variants. So each one, one copy is mutated. We're gonna assume here that we know one comes from mom and one comes from dad, but that usually takes a little bit of extra testing. Both of these mutations are considered pathogenic, so both are known to cause disease. And this is an autosomal recessive condition. So two copies of the gene, both are mutated, both cause disease. This is a diagnostic result for a recessive condition. And this particular gene, STRC, is associated with non-syndromic autosomal recessive hearing loss. So again, positive diagnostic results. Another example of a positive result, we have a homozygous variant. Both copies are mutated and they have the same mutation. Oops, sorry. Um, oh goodness, yeah. 
Um, both copies are mutated, same mutation. It's a recessive disease gene. The mutations are pathogenic or disease causing. And this is the GJB2 mutation, which is the non-syndromic recessive hearing loss. Next one, this result is not positive. This result shows that a person is a carrier for a genetic condition only. So this person has a heterozygous, one variant, in an autosomal recessive disease gene. So in order to have symptoms, you have to have two mutations, and this person just has one. So this person would be considered a carrier for Pendred syndrome. They have one mutation in the gene that causes Pendred syndrome, but no second mutation was identified. Next, we have the dreaded uncertain results, the variant of uncertain significance. A mutation is identified and reported, but we don't know what it means. So in this case, our person has a single uncertain variant in a hemizygous state, and the gene is X-linked COL4A5. So the person has one mutation which may or may not cause disease. This person may or may not have Alport syndrome. In these cases, sometimes we have to test other family members. Sometimes we have to do other screens. Like in this case, we might test their kidney function. But these can be really frustrating because we can't tell a family this is a diagnosis or this is nothing. So those are kind of examples of what the results reports might show. But that's usually not what results reports look like. This is usually what results reports look like. So the lab tells you a ton of information. You're going to get disease-causing variants in multiple genes. You're going to get uncertain variants in multiple genes. You're going to get carrier status. You're going to get all sorts of stuff kind of all reported in this giant jumble. And this is what our families are given and sometimes left to figure it out on their own. So this is just a lot to deal with. And as a person who works in genetics, I can glance at this table and tell you really quickly, whoops, my lights. <laughs> I can look at this and tell you really quickly, this is a diagnostic result for Usher syndrome type 2A. They have two mutations, one on each copy of the Usher2A gene that causes autosomal recessive Usher syndrome. But for families or people who are not comfortable looking at this information, it's a lot. It's overwhelming. It's confusing. There are a ton of different pitfalls you could fall into where families are misunderstanding their results or providers are misinterpreting them and giving families incorrect information. So it's a lot. Um, I will say from my own experience, some labs are better than others at kind of streamlining the information. Um, Gene DX is really good about just telling you on the first page of the report the stuff that's most important and they leave all the junk and all the noise to like pages two and three and four of the report in vitae we'll give it all on the first page and that is way confusing and overwhelming for families and providers so that's a little bit about what genetic tests themselves look like and why this gets really confusing really quickly. Um, last couple things that I had were just some resources that might be beneficial to you. Um, these three websites are my absolute go-tos for when I need quick information about a gene, a genetic condition, and I just need to read some information really quickly. The first one is OMIM, or the Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man. This website, you type in a gene name and it will give you a table of all of the different things that can be seen with that particular gene and genetic syndrome. Medline Plus Genetics is the one on the side. This one is really great because you type in a gene or a genetic condition and it will give you a narrative. It will give you written paragraphs that talk you through all that process. Some families really want something to read. This can be really good for them. And then at the bottom, the last resource is called Gene Reviews. This is gonna be a much more deep dive, intense, many, many, many pages long information for healthcare providers and folks who want a deep dive of information talking about genes and genetic conditions. And then finally, for families who get a diagnosis or do genetic testing or just want more information, there are a ton of diagnosis specific 
or patient population specific support organizations out there that have information for families affected by conditions like Usher, like mitochondrial disease, like Stickler, like non-syndromic hearing impairment. These populations are out there um, and they have really great organizations that support them. So definitely great resources once your families get a genetic diagnosis to kind of push them in those directions. And that's all I had. Um, so I'm happy with our remaining time to, to chat through any questions. Like I said, there's no silly or stupid questions. This stuff is pretty intense for a lot of people. Um, and I'm happy to help in any way that I can. I have a question. Um, do you, do, do families usually start out with maybe just providing genetic testing for their child or do some, is it, is it ever recommended to go ahead and like mom and dad get two? What, or is there yeah. siblings? Great question. Um, so usually our path with kids who have hearing loss is we start by testing the person in the family who's affected. If it's a child, if it's son and mom, if it's multiple generations, we will try and test a person who has the hearing loss first and then look to testing other family members to gather more information. Another question, I know you said, um, and of course it's family's choice and it's not a requirement for care, yeah. but if, are there, is there, I don't know, like, would you, are you, like, you'd be a proponent of encouraging our families to pursue this if they're interested? And if so, what language, like, if they say why, why would I want to do that? Or why would I need to do that, basically? Yeah. So um, I think that usually my, my kind of go-to answer for why when families are a little bit on the, the fence is to ask families, you know, what information would be helpful for you to know? Because it's possible genetic testing can give you answers to some questions that you have. So the kind of big categories, number one is, you know, we know your child has hearing loss, but what we don't know is if they're at risk for any other health complications. If they perhaps have a syndromic form, genetic testing could tell us that and guide their medical management. Um, genetic testing can also give us sometimes some prognostic information about a child's hearing impairment. Is it likely to be progressive, for example, or is it likely to be, you know, stable? And what we have now is what we're always going to have. Um, the other things are kind of beyond just the individual care of the child would be things like recurrence. Some families are very concerned about the idea of having another child with hearing impairment. Some families don't care. Some families are like, yeah, whatever, healthy kid's a healthy kid. Um, but some families do really want to know, you know, if we have another child, could this be something that our children have again? Or, or when my affected child is grown, could they have children who are hearing impaired? So having the information about, you know, recurrence can be really helpful for some families. So that's kind of the way that I would pitch it is it can be helpful for the child. It can be helpful for prognosticating their hearing changes over time. And it can be helpful for, for family planning purposes if and when families are interested in that information. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah I was gonna say uh, exactly that. Uh, whenever I've told families in the past about genetic testing, I just kind of advocate for the health aspects of it. Um, you know, like I know that I don't have any health issues, but like what if something came up like on a test that I, I had a co-occurring something that was going on like charge, you know, something going on with your heart and you don't know about it. So that's just kind of how I approach it, Nikki, just like to make sure that they're healthy and safe and that we're aware of any potential mm -hmm. other complications that could come up in the future. So when I think there's been a lot of, um, very fair criticism of the field of genetics in the past that we are in the business of eugenics. So we're, we're trying to breed out, you know, deaf people from the population. This is a community we're trying to get rid of or erase. And that is just absolutely not the case. Um, 
we really do see information as beneficial for lots of reasons. Some families do make decisions about, you know, reproductive health decisions based on genetic testing, but that's certainly not, you know, the reason why these services are offered, at least not for us. I just want to acknowledge real quick, though, that that could be a valid concern for any deaf or hard of hearing families that you come across. I don't Absolutely. mean with children who are deaf or hard of hearing, but like if you come across any deaf parent, um, just make sure that they're aware that like, you know, the geneticists that you work with are not here to weed out their deaf children. Yes. Um, because I know that is a valid concern for some people. Yes. Oh, completely. And I will say just based on the referrals that we get into our clinic, we almost exclusively see families with hearing parents and deaf children. That's the bulk of the referrals that come to us. Um, so there's definitely a lot of, of that fear and mistrust in the community in general. We're very, very aware of um, how our profession is perceived. And again, validly so. Our, our profession is based in the horrors of eugenics, unfortunately. Do you specialize in hearing-based genetic testing, or is it just that you're here talking to us today and you do all kinds of genetic panels? I actually don't work with hearing loss patients anymore. Um, I'm uh, exclusively pretty much in the NICU. I work with newborns, but in my previous position, when I was seeing patients in clinic, I did have a hearing loss clinic. You may have answered this question already, Hannah, and if so, I apologize. Um, I have noticed that in the smaller areas that I cover, mm -hmm. um, especially here in central Louisiana, uh, most of my families are not like automatically referred for genetics. Um, yes. I guess I'm just spoiled to that because we moved here from Little Rock and <laughs> it was just, Abby was born and we were automatically sent there. And so I never questioned, yes. but if my families want to be referred, how, who do they need to go back to in order to get that referral? Yeah, so um, with Oshner Genetics, where I work right now, um, we don't even need a referral. Families can uh, call in and say, hey, I want an appointment. And we say, great. Okay. Um, some other health systems, uh, there's genetics at Our Lady of the Lake, there's genetics at Children's Hospital in Tulane. They do ask for some type of written referral from a medical professional of some kind, um, but we we know there's enough barriers to accessing genetic services that no practices in Louisiana are going to be overly stringent about, you know, families needing to prove that they need to see genetics. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If a family is already receiving their care at one hospital, does it matter which one they go to for their testing or can they all get them the same tests, the same time, the same insurance situation? Doesn't matter um, when we can see everybody's records at all the different health systems. So it's all good. There are so few of us. I think there's only five, six geneticists in the entire state of Louisiana. So it's such a small field that we're all very close and communicative. And that's why the wait list is so long because there are so few providers. What did you say the average wait time was for results? I would, oh, for, for an appointment, it's about a year. For results, two to three to four weeks, very fast in terms of genetic testing. And this is Nikki. I just wanted to add to you that um, a resource that I've been made available or I've been made aware of that's available to families um, that have either have Usher syndrome in their family or have a known um, eye disease or retinal issue. Like if those kids have already been or flagged as kind of having some type of eye problem mm -hmm. or some type of inherited retinal disease in their family, they can, um, this organization called the Foundation Fighting Blindness, um, which I can never say without saying that I don't like that name, even though I appreciate the work they do. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. will, um, they have a program that pays for genetic testing for, um, little ones. If there is, there has to be some type of eye concern, whether it's in their family or diagnosed in the kiddo. So just sort of your average deaf and hard of hearing kids, that's not a resource for, but if they do have that eye concern, then, um, the foundation fighting blindness fund will pay for the genetic testing, kind of help them facilitate it. And they have certain ophthalmologists that are familiar with using that resource and can order the cheek swab and, do the results. And so that won't 
that's they won't do like a, a deaf hard of hearing panel, but they will do a panel that includes like Usher syndrome and some other things like that. So that's a resource that some kids can use, even though it's not going to capture everything. Yeah. Um, and it's a fantastic resource because, again, the testing is completely sponsored. So the lab gets reimbursed for the work that they do and, and the families and their insurance companies do not pay a penny for it. So that's a really great option. Um, the other thing is the reason why I included that information about billing and self-pay prices is um, if you're getting genetic testing or if a family is getting genetic testing through a provider who's not very familiar with ordering genetic testing, um, it can be ordered incorrectly and then families can get stuck with very big bills. So that's why I like um, to tell as many people as possible, you know, the maximum anyone should ever have to pay for these tests is $250. And if a family is told it's going to be $800, you know, that's unacceptable. And that would be a reason to call a genetics provider and say, hey, my family was told this really high number and that can't be right. Can you help us out? Raising children is expensive enough. <laughs> <laughs> um another random question how um have you heard of uh 1p36 deletion yeah um i actually just recently had a sweet little baby with 1p36 i think he just finally graduated from our cvicu okay I, I have a kiddo on my caseload and it's yeah. very new <laughs> to me. So um, yeah. I was just curious if like surface information, like if you have any that you can give real fast. <laughs> the problem with 1P36 is um, we actually like very within the last like two weeks, my doctor that I work with and I were talking about how there are not any really good resources for 1P36. We don't have any new care management or practice guidelines for 1P36 kids. A lot of the guidelines that we do have are published like 2005 and earlier. So they're just old and not good, um, which is so, so, so frustrating. Um, one resource that I would recommend is an, a group called Unique Rare Chromosome Support Group, I think. Um, but just like look up Unique Rare Chromosome. And it's, it's a patient or family run organization, and they have a database where families with children or who are themselves affected with rare chromosome conditions can submit information. And then they compile it into these, gosh, into these really wonderful um, written like pamphlets of information. So I would definitely recommend checking out Unique just for some good like layman, family oriented basic information about 1P36 and any chromosome condition, honestly. I had a question, but I lost it. So if I remember, I'll email it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, you all should have my contact information. It's my first name dot my last name at oshner.org. Um, I'm happy to help with anything that I can. And that also means if you have a family that has been having a really hard time accessing genetic services or got their testing done through some other outside center and they don't understand the results, they have questions, you know, I'm here as a resource for families as well. Um, I actually love getting random emails from, from patients and parents. So I'm more than happy to, to set up, you know, counseling appointments for families who already had testing and just want to talk through their results a little bit more. Right. Any other thoughts, any other questions? I hope this information was helpful and, and at least is, is um, maybe making you think about genetic testing a little bit differently and feel a little bit more comfortable um, talking to your families about it when they bring it up, because they will, because they, they trust y'all a lot and they have really good rapport with y'all, probably more so than they have with any other members of their care teams. I can certainly see where and how parents would be overwhelmed. It's a lot yes. of information. And I've had kids in the past where the parents told me they have this, you know, and they would name it, but they really didn't know anything about it. And so I would have to kind of research it myself to figure out what was going on with the kid. Cause the parent, I'm sure they were given the information, but it went, 
because it's right. just too and, much for them to process. And it's so much, and it's it's even the G names, it's all these letters and numbers thrown together. And and even the most well-intentioned healthcare providers, we we get into doctor speak a little bit too much and, and um, don't always bring ourselves to the level. We don't always meet families where they're at in terms of the information sharing that happens. And we don't always have the luxury of time to really go over with families to the depth that they need to best support their child, unfortunately. Um, I have a question or a comment. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking, I'm a deaf person, if that wasn't obvious by the interpreter here, uh, but I was just thinking like how it feels for these parents whenever they're first told that their kids are deaf, um, that's already a really tough, traumatizing sometimes experience. Yeah. And then you go to the geneticist and then you hear about your child having this, oh my gosh, a high risk for disease and it's pathogenic and all sorts of like medical jargon. And I'm yeah. just wondering like, is there training for geneticists or other professionals who are disseminating this information to be able to deliver it in a more sensitive manner so that parents are not just hearing about how pathogenic and diseased their children are? Yes, and that training is me. Um, uh, genetic counselors typically work with genetics providers to take that extra time to talk with families and again, to give them the information at the level that they're at. Um, that's why I prefer to use words like positive, negative, and a question mark rather than pathogenic, benign, and uncertain, because those are really, you know, heavy terms. And the other thing is um, we find that that repetition can be really helpful and in introducing information in kind of a slow, measured way um, as to not overwhelm families in the beginning, because for some families, you know, the news that, oh my gosh, my child is deaf, that there's a, there's a grieving, there's a mourning, there's a, a almost in some cases, a trauma that happens in those moments, um, regardless of if that child is at risk for other health complications down the road. So we try and be pretty sensitive with that process. Um, definitely, it doesn't happen in the best way in Louisiana. I've noticed I'm, I'm not from Louisiana originally, and I think it, the, the information dissemination process here could definitely be improved. Um, because oftentimes the, you know, the families are told when their baby is getting ready to leave the hospital, oh, your baby failed their hearing screen. You'll get a call from an audiologist to set up an appointment in three weeks. And the families are kind of in like this, wait, what? Period. And it, it just, it's, it doesn't really serve anyone the way that the model is currently used. Um, well, I guess it's in the future, if any of your geneticists would like to work more on their terminology or delivery for working with families that are deaf or hard of hearing themselves or have children who are deaf or hard of hearing, I'm happy to work with you all on that. Yeah. yeah, that'd be fantastic. I actually would um, love to chat with you a little bit offline about um, kind of what what you were told about your parents' experiences with your diagnosis and versus how and I can't see you on my screen right now, and I, I don't know what your personal situation is like if you are a parent or or not, but I would love to, to get your perspective a little bit more as an adult in this situation. Uh, sure. I think Missy would be a great person to add into that conversation as well, since she has some experience with uh, her daughter getting identified and working with the geneticist as well. Yeah. And I, I think with, you know, COVID restrictions opening up quite a bit, um, I would love to to put more like uh, public facing panels uh, together, um, and people are not that interested in hearing medical professionals talk, but people are interested in hearing patients and parents talk about their own experiences. That's where the best lessons are learned, anyway. All right, I don't see any other questions. Um, if it's okay with you, then what I'll do once we are all wrapped up, I will forward your presentation. Um, I assume it's fine. I go ahead and share the PowerPoint and still have it on the recording. Uh, so I'll pass along the PowerPoint and then I'll put your email in there so that everyone can email if any questions pop up for them. Um, if you want to just have a quick rundown of who is where, so then you know like what general area everybody's in whenever they yeah. reach out. Um, we'll That'd be great. Talk that real quick. Uh, I am the supervisor over the outreach program, so I work with everybody this year, uh, except for Nikki, she's just a, a colleague of ours. <laughs> um, 
and the interpreters. <laughs> um, but so I'll let my team start off and just tell you what area they're in and if you have any specific um, area specific resources that you want to share, then you can kind of get a better gist of that. Uh, I'll start with Missy because she's the first on my screen. I'm always first. <laughs> Um, Misty Flowers, I cover central Louisiana and southwest, so that's the Lake Charles and Lafayette area. Um, so I have a few families with the uh, Usher's diagnosis because, you know, Cajun strong, that's, that's the area I cover. Uh, Rachel's next on my screen. <laughs> Hey, I'm Rachel Nelson. I cover um, New Orleans and everything north of New Orleans, Covington up to Bogalusa. Uh, real quick, uh, Hannah, if you do want to see everyone's faces, if you just switch to gallery view, you should be able to see them. Um, I just have the interpreter spot that for the purpose of recording. I'm getting like five of you at a time. It's totally fine. <laughs> okay, wow. <laughs> All right, um, and then next is Yvette. Hi, I'm Yvette. I work in the greater New Orleans area. Um, the counterpart of Rachel, so she works the north, I work the south. I go down to the Homa area, Thibodeau, that area down there, along with the greater New Orleans. Plus, I have families that speak Spanish, so I'm kind of like scattered around everywhere, wherever there's a need. I will say a quick note um, for families who are Spanish speaking, I would highly highly recommend Dr. Regina Zambrano at Children's Hospital. She's um, Colombian, native Spanish speaker, um, and very comfortable with working with the deaf and hard of hearing populations in Louisiana. Um, and of course, very comfortable working with families who are non-native English speakers. Okay, and uh, she's just like awesome. Uh, Rachel, can you note that for our contacts list? Uh, Regina- Would you mind to put that in the chat? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Regina is what kind of doctor again? She's a geneticist. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And she's at Children's. I worked with her for years. She's wonderful. I'm going to do that right now. And for the record for y'all, uh, I have never been genetically tested, <laughs> but we do suspect that probably what I have is a particular like mutation that's specific to uh, Latino women who have progressive hearing loss. So that's what they suspect is non-syndromic, it just happens. So that's what we suspect I've got. Um, so maybe you can consider that if you have any Latin little girls um, that are showing progressive, that could be something that you can ask for testing. Uh, next I see Cheryl. <clears throat> Sorry, I was muted. I'm Cheryl, and I'm Cheryl Glass, and I work uh, North Louisiana. Um, I actually live in Natchitoches, and so Natchitoches Parish, North Miss, uh, Texas to Mississippi, so all the way across the top of the state. I do you are have, in a desert for genetic services. <laughs> yeah. Uh, most of my families go to New Orleans, Baton Rouge, somewhere, you know. Um, I do have one kiddo with charge. <clears throat> I have one with Pallister Killian syndrome, but um, they're not sure that her hearing levels are due to that. She was also shaken as an, an infant. Um, and I have one, well, I have, a, she also has um, CVI and I have one that's deaf blind from meningitis. So got a lot of different stuff going on up here. Uh, next, I see Laura. Hi, I'm Laura Cleaver. I work with the Baton Rouge Livingston Ascension area, um, mainly the moderate to profoundly deaf uh, babies. And then I see Anna just unmuted herself. She's the next one. <laughs> Um, it won't let me, um, I had to start on my phone because my computer was taking so long. So it won't let me turn my video back on, but I'm Anna and I do greater Baton Rouge area. Oh, there we go. Now, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so yeah, now you can kind of get a general idea of where everybody is, what hospitals and geneticists are kind of available in their area. 
Um, but if y'all need to know any specific names or contacts, we can email you, right, and see where to reach out to. Okay, great. Perfect. And I'll just um, say real quick, um, there are genetic services in New Orleans, obviously, um, in Baton Rouge, and then there is uh, Dr. Zimbrano actually goes to Covington, so there is specific services on the North Shore, um, and then there are virtual clinics, which are not so great, but we kind of do what we can um, that serve Lafayette, formerly Lake Charles, not anymore. And then there is a virtual clinic that happens like once a month um, up in Shreveport through Willis Knighton, but that wait list is astronomically long. So unfortunately for folks who are north of Baton Rouge, um, it's, it's going to be a car ride or a virtual visit. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, All right, so great. any questions <laughs> come up, uh, we'll shoot you an email. I will send everybody the PowerPoint. Um, I know, Nikki, you've already got a copy, but I'll forward it to my team and uh, pass along your email as well. Thank you so much, Hannah. Yeah, it was an absolute pleasure. Nice to meet y'all. Yeah. Thank you, Nikki, for setting this up. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah, such a pleasure. Nice to see you all. Thank you, Hannah. Thanks, Natalie. Bye. Thanks, interpreters. All right, thanks. Uh, if my team can stay on for like five minutes, just hang out. Um, interpreter, y'all can roll out there. You're good. Thank you. Everybody's um, losing all of the chats and stuff. Okay. Hey, so real quick, uh, Dr. Martin, I did text you a little bit, um, but Dr. Martin just asked that we share. Trying to move my little captions. Uh, asked if we could share like three or four highlights from our department for him to share during our board meeting next week. I'm recording. Can we stop the recording? You don't need to record on that.